Itur Jesus Christus. Welcome to this live broadcast from the Aula della Benedizione. Pope Francis right now coming down the aisle, and he'll be meeting here this morning with the members of the Diplomatic Corps accredited to the Holy See on their annual New Year's greeting. From wherever you're joining us, a warm welcome to all of you, especially those tuning in through our various Vatican channels. To those of you joining through television, whether you're tuning in through Catholic TV, Catholic Faith Network, Shalom World Television Networks, EWTN, Salt and Light TV at Madarshan TV. To our radio listeners, especially to you tuning in through Luminous Radio, a welcome to you. And to all those joining in through other local radio broadcasters or internet sites. The first address we should be hearing this morning is from the Dean of the Diplomatic Corps from Cyprus, Georges Pulides. The Aula delle Benedizione located in the facade of St. Peter's. It was completed in the 1600s and here we he said thank you Holy Father for your prayers this year I will give my greeting standing up your holiness as Dean of the diplomatic corps accredited to the Holy See I have the great honor to express once again our best wishes for your good health and a new year and our hope that your apostolic mission will continue to bear much fruit. Permit me to express our joy at being able to come together for this customary moment of encounter which fills our hearts with hope and shows the world in a symbolic way the representatives of states gathered around the Holy Father. The year of the pandemic, which continues to drag on, has seen you unremittingly doing all you can to promote peace, build dialogue, safeguard the environment, and protect the weakest and defenseless. In every way, in season and out of season, you have been untiring in insisting that we cannot save ourselves on our own. As you pointed out in the encyclical Fratelli Tutti, the pandemic is without doubt the test of our time, in which no one can isolate himself, either individually or collectively. It is not possible to emerge from the health crisis caused by COVID-19 by recovering lost normality with its inequalities and forms of sufferings. We have to find new solutions that will make us change our lifestyles. In Fratelli Tutti, you proposed a profound revolution of fraternity in which we can all play an act part, individuals as well as states. To be brothers and sisters means having a common home. This is a message that you elucidated in the encyclical Laudato Si in 2015. Indeed, there was need of it. In these years, your message has contributed to preparing the ground for greater receptivity to a change of approach in environmental policy, which was a central theme at the Conference of the Parties of the United Nations Organization, better known as COP26, which took place in Glasgow during the year that has just ended. Since you were fully aware that the problem could be resolved only with everyone's cooperation on October 4th last, together with numerous religious and scientific authorities, you launched and signed a joint appeal addressed to the COP26 participants 
requesting the promotion of education in integral ecology, drawing on a cultural model centered on fraternity. We are all brothers and sisters, and we have a common home. This is a message that everyone can understand, and it has a great moral and political value. Holy Father, you ask for an urgent change of direction, moving from a throwaway culture to a culture of care for our common home, because the young will inherit the planet we choose to leave to them. Now is the moment for decisions that can provide them with reasons for hope and trust in the future. Holy Father, I would like to remind this gathering of what you said in 2019 in your message for the launch of the Global Education Compact. All change requires an educational process aimed at developing a new universal solidarity and a more welcoming society. The force of this message of peace becomes clearer with every passing year. Faced with the emergence of new forms of suffering and the deterioration of old, tragic situations, you do not propose simplistic solutions that are narrow in scope, but you invite us to build a lasting peace. Each of us is and should consider himself or herself a protagonist in the building of a world at peace by concentrating our actions in three directions that you have pointed out and clearly defined. Foster intergenerational dialogue by implementing shared projects, promote education as a factor of freedom, responsibility, and development, guarantee working conditions for the realization of human dignity. Holy Father, your extraordinary sensitivity to human discontent and social instability was evident during your journey to the heart of Europe in Slovakia. There, you defended human dignity and the right to work, using words which I take the liberty to share. Just as without bread there is no nutrition, there, without labor there is no dignity. You invite us to build just societies characterized by solidarity and based on work so that no one will feel marginalized or constrained to leave family and homeland in search of a better life. The world must not look away from those places where these conditions are yet to be met. Durant votre pèlerinage aux sources de la fraternité et de l'humanité, à Chypre en Grèce, c'était. Holy Father, your pilgrimage to the wellsprings of fraternity and humanity in Cyprus and Greece, you issued a strong appeal for the integration of migrants. The sea, which embraces many peoples with its open ports, reminds us that the sources of living together lie in mutual acceptance. Your Holiness, in Cyprus, you exhorted the international community to flee from the temptation to build walls of fear, and you express the hope that the island, which is a crossroads of civilizations, might become a workshop of peace or a laboratory of peace. I was an eyewitness of your apostolic journey to Cyprus, which is has a majority of Orthodox, and I was able to see for myself how your presence was not only greeted with enthusiasm, but also brought about unity and gave hope. In Greece, you focused attention on the importance of hospitality because where migrants, refugees, and displaced persons are concerned, human lives are at stake. And you emphasize that when we reject the poor, we reject peace. Peace and dialogue were also at the center of your first historic journey to Iraq, 
We're in line with the encyclical Fratelli Tutti. You emphasize the concept and practice of fraternity, at the same time pursuing the path set out in the Declaration on Human Fraternity, signed in Abu Dhabi. Holy Father, at your meeting with the authorities in the presidential palace in Baghdad last March, you reminded us that a society that bears the imprint of fraternal unity is one whose members live in solidarity with one another. You also launched an appeal to the international community not to withdraw the outstretched hand of friendship and constructive engagement in order to maintain peace. Holy Father, allow me to acknowledge your commitment to the promotion of women and the recognition of their active role in society and in the making of the history of humanity. I make my own your words. We have to fight for the dignity of women. They are the ones who carry history forward. We have seen in you, Holy Father, an evangelical courage that inspires us. During the interreligious ceremony organized by the St. Egidio community at the Colosseum on October 7, 2021, as if you were looking at the world of the future, you said, this takes real courage, the courage of compassion, a courage that goes beyond complacency, beyond the mindset of it doesn't concern me, and it has nothing to do with my life. We cannot allow the lives of entire peoples to become mere pawns in a game of power. No, the lives of people are not part of a game. They are a serious matter and concern everyone. These words not only inspire your ministry, but also our activity as diplomats and as a diplomatic family. We would like to share your courage and bear witness that the lives of prophet, uh, that the lives of peoples are a serious matter and concern us all. Holy Father, I ask you to accept our best wishes for a happy new year and for your good health. I wish to thank you in the name of the diplomatic family accredited to the Holy See, which I represent as Dean, for the strength you have communicated to us during the year just ended. Thank you, Holy Father, for your untiring work, which is a source of hope for many peoples, for many men and women. Thank you words of the Dean of the Diplomatic Corps, the Ambassador of Cyprus to the Holy See, Georges Poulidis. We are meeting in the Hall of Blessings in the facade of St. Peter's. It was built between 1608 and 1614. There are nine windows that overlook St. Peter's Square and three balconies from which out of one of those the Holy Fathers come when they first are elected and when they give the Orbi at Orbi addresses. Here we're seeing the inside of this facade which stands on its own foundation. We see the beautiful stuccoed walls covered in gild, gilded gold. And we now await the Holy Father's address. Your Excellencies, Lady and Gentlemen, yesterday the liturgical season of Christmas concluded a privileged period for cultivating family relationships from which we can at times be distracted and distant due to our many commitments during the year. Today we want to continue in that spirit as we once more come together as a large family which discusses and dialogues. In the end, this is the end of all diplomacy, to help resolve disagreements arising from human coexistence, to foster harmony. And to realize that once we pass beyond conflict, we can recover 
a sense of the profound unity of all reality. I am therefore particularly grateful to you for taking part today in our annual family gathering, a propitious occasion for exchanging good wishes for the new year and for considering together the lights and shadows of our time. I especially thank the Dean, His Excellency Mr. George Pulitz, the Ambassador of Cyprus, for his gracious words addressed to me in the name of the entire diplomatic corps. Through all of you, I extend my affectionate greetings to the people you represent. Your presence is always a tangible sign of the attention your countries devote to the Holy See and its role in the international community. Many of you have come from other capital cities for today's event, thus joining the numerous ambassadors residing in Rome who will soon be joined by the Swiss Confederation. Dear Ambassadors, in these days, we are conscious that the fight against the pandemic still calls for a significant effort on the part of everyone. Certainly, the new year will continue to be demanding in this regard. The coronavirus continues to cause social isolation and to take lives. Among those who have died, I would like to mention the late Archbishop Aldo Giordano, an apostolic nuncio who was well known and respected in the diplomatic community. At the same time, we have realized that in those places where an effective vaccination campaign has taken place, the risk of severe repercussions of the disease has decreased. It is therefore important to continue the effort to immunize the general population as much as possible. This calls for a manifold commitment on the personal, political, and international levels. First, on the personal level. Each of us has a responsibility to care for ourself and our health. And this translates into respect for the health of those around us. Health care is a moral obligation. Sadly, we are finding increasingly that we live in a world of strong ideological divides. Frequently, people allow themselves to be influenced by the ideology of the moment, often bolstered by basely, baseless information or poorly documented facts. Every ideolog ideological statement severs the bond of human reason with the objective reality of things. The pandemic, on the other hand, urges us to adopt a sort of reality therapy that makes us confront the problem head-on and adopt suitable remedies to resolve it. Vaccines are not a magical means of healing, yet surely they represent, in addition to other treatments that need to be developed, the most reasonable solution for the prevention of the disease. A political commitment is thus needed to pursue the good of the general population through measures of prevention and immunization that also engage citizens so that they can feel involved and responsible thanks to a clear discussion of the problems and the appropriate means of addressing them. The lack of resolute decision-making and clear communication generates confusion, creates mistrust, and undermines social cohesion, fueling new tensions. The result is a social relativism detrimental to harmony and unity. In the end, a comprehensive commitment on the part of the international community is necessary so that the entire world population can have equal access to essential medical care and vaccines. 
we can only note with regret that for large areas of the world, a uni universal access to health care remains an illusion. At this grave moment in the life of humanity, I reiterate my appeal that governments and concerned private entities demonstrate a sense of responsibility, developing a coordinated response at every level, local, national, regional, global, through new models of solidarity and tools to strengthen the capabilities of those countries in greatest need. In particular, I urge all states who are working to establish an international instrument on pandemic preparedness and response under the aegis of the World Health Organizations to adopt a policy of generous sharing as a key principle to guarantee everyone access to diagnostic tools, vaccines, and drugs. Likewise, it is appropriate that institutions such as the World Trade Organization and the World Intellectual Property Organization adapt their legal instruments, lest monopolistic rules constitute further obstacles to production and to an organized and consistent access to health care on a global level. Dear ambassadors, Last year, thanks also to the lessening of the restrictions put in place in 2020, I had occasion to receive many heads of state and governments, as well as various civil and religious authorities. Among those many meetings, I would like to mention that of July 1st, devoted to reflection and prayer for Lebanon to the beloved Lebanese people who are working to find a solution to the economic and political crisis that has gripped the nation, I wish today to renew my closeness and my prayers. At the same time, I trust that necessary reforms and the support of the international community will help the country to persevere in its proper identity as a model of peaceful coexistence and brotherhood among the different religions. In the course of 2021, I was also able to resume my apostolic journeys. In March, I had the joy of traveling to Iraq. Providence willed this as a sign of hope after years of war and terrorism. The Iraqi people have the right to regain their dignity and to live in peace. Their religious and cultural roots go back thousands of years. Mesopotamia is a cradle of civilization. It is from there that God called Abraham to inaugurate the history of salvation. In September, I traveled to Budapest for the conclusion of the International Eucharistic Congress and then to Slovakia. It was an opportunity for me to meet with the Catholic faithful and Christians of other confessions and to dialogue with the Jewish community. I likewise traveled to Cyprus and Greece, a journey that remains vivid in my memory. That visit allowed me to deepen ties with our Orthodox brothers and to experience the fraternity existing between the various Christian confessions. A very moving part of that journey was my visit to the island of Lesbos, where I was able to see at first hand the generosity of all those working to provide hospitality and assistance to migrants, but above all to see the faces of the many children and adults who are guests of these centers of hospitality. Their eyes spoke of the effort of their journey, their fear of an uncertain future, their sorrow for the loved ones they left behind and their nostalgia for the homeland they were forced to depart. Before those faces, we cannot be indifferent or hide behind walls and barbed wires under the pretext of defending security or a style of life. This cannot be done. 
quanti individui e i governi si adoperano per garantire l'accoglienza e protezione ai migranti, facendosi carico anche della loro promozione umana. Consequently, I think all those individuals and governments working to ensure that migrants are welcomed and protected and to support their human promotion and integration in the countries they have received them. I am aware of the difficulties that some states encounter in the face of a large influx of people. No one can be asked to do what is impossible for them, yet there is a clear difference between accepting, albeit in a limited way, and rejecting completely. There is a need to overcome indifference and to reject the idea that migrants are a problem for others. The results of this approach are evident in the dehumanization of those migrants co concentrated in hot spots where they end up as easy prey to organized crime and human traffickers or engage in desperate attempts to escape that at times result in death. Sadly, we must also note that migrants are themselves often turned into a weapon of political blackmail, becoming a sort of bargaining commodity that deprives them of their dignity. Here I would like to renew my gratitude to the Italian authorities, thanks to whom several persons were able to come with me to Rome from Cyprus and Greece. This was a simple yet meaningful gesture. To the Italian people, who suffered greatly at the beginning of the pandemic, but who have also shown encouraging signs of recovery, I express my heartfelt hope that they will always maintain their characteristic spirit of generosity, openness, and solidarity. At the same time, I consider it essential that the European Union arrive at internal cohesion in handling migration movements, just as it did in dealing with the effects of the pandemic. There is a need to adopt a coherent and comprehensive system for coordinating policies on migration and, and asylum, with a view to sharing responsibility for the reception of migrants. The review of requests for asylum and the redistribution and integration of those who can be accepted. The capacity to negotiate and discover shared solutions is one of the strong points of the European Union. It represents a sound model for a far sighted approach to the global challenges before us. Nonetheless, the migration issue does not regard Europe alone even though it is especially affected by waves of migrants coming from a Africa and from Asia. In recent years, we have witnessed, among others, an exodus of Syrian refugees, and more recently, the many people who have fled Afghanistan. Nor can we overlook the massive migration movements on the American continent, which press upon the border between Mexico and the United States of America. Many of those migrants are Haitians, fleeing the tragedies that have struck their country in recent years. The issue of migration, together with the pandemic and climate change, has clearly demonstrated that we cannot be saved alone and by ourselves. The great challenges of our time are all global. It is thus troubling that alongside the greater interconnection of problems, we are seeing a growing fragmentation of solutions. It is not uncommon to encounter unwillingness to open windows of dialogue and spaces of fraternity. This only fuels further tensions and divisions, as well as a generalized feeling of uncertainty and instability. What is needed instead is a recovery of our sense of shared identity as a single human family. The alternative can only be growing isolation, marked by a reciprocal rejection and refusal that further endangers 
multilateralism, the diplomatic style that has characterized international relations from the end of the Second World War to the present. For some time now, multilateral diplomacy has been experiencing a crisis of trust due to the reduced credibility of social, governmental, and intergovernmental systems. Important resolutions, declarations, and decisions are frequently made without a genuine process of negotiation in which all countries have a say. This imbalance, now dramatically evident, has, gener has generated disaffection towards international agencies on the part of many states. It also weakens the multilateral system as a whole, with the result that it becomes less and less effective in confronting global challenges. The diminished effectiveness of many international organizations is also due to their members entertaining differing visions of the ends they wish to pursue. Not infrequently, the centers of interest, the center of interest has shifted to matters that by their divisive nature do not strictly belong to the aims of the organization. As a result, agendas are increasingly dictated by a mindset that rejects the, nat the natural foundations of humanity and the cultural roots that constitute the identity of many peoples. As I have stated on other occasions, I consider this a form of ideological colonization that leaves no room for freedom of expression and is now taking the form of the cancel culture, invading many circles and public institutions. Under the guise of defending diversity, it ends up canceling all sense of identity with the risk of silencing positions that defend a respectful and balanced understanding of various sensibilities, a kind of one-track thinking is taking shape, one constrained to deny history, or worse yet, to rewrite it in terms of present-day categories, whereas any historical situation must be interpreted in accordance with the hermeneutics of that particular time. La diplomazia multilaterale è chiamata perciò Multilateral diplomacy is thus called to be truly inclusive, not cancelling, but cherishing the differences and sensibilities that have historically marked various peoples. In this way, it will regain credibility and effectiveness in facing the challenges to come, which will require humanity to join together as one great family, that, starting from differing viewpoints, should prove capable of finding common solutions for the good of all. This requires reciprocal trust and willingness to dialogue. It entails listening to one another, sharing different views, coming to agreement, and walking together. Indeed, dialogue is the best way to realize what ought always to be affirmed and respected apart from any ephemeral consensus, nor should we overlook the existence of certain enduring valleys. Those are not always easy to discern, but their acceptance makes for a robust and solid social ethics. Once those fundamental values are adopted through dialogue and consensus, we realize that they rise above consensus. Here, I wish to mention in particular the right to life, from conception to its natural end, and the right to religious freedom. In this regard, in recent years we have seen a growing collective awareness of the urgent need to care for our common home, which is suffering from the constant and indiscriminate exploitation of its resources. Here I think especially of the Philippines, struck in these last weeks by a devastating typhoon, and of other nations in the Pacific, 
made vulnerable by the negative effects of climate change, which endanger the lives of their inhabitants, most of whom are dependent on agriculture, fishing, and natural resources. This realiza realiza realization should impel the international community as a whole to discover and implement common solutions. None may consider themselves exempt from this effort since all of us are involved and affected in equal measure. At the recent COP26 in Glasgow, several steps were made in the right direction even though they were rather weak in light of the gravity of the problem to be faced. The road to meeting the goals of the Paris Agreement is complex and appears to be long, while the time at our disposal is shorter and shorter. Much still remains to be done. And so 2022 will be another fundamental e year for verifying to what extent and in what ways the decisions taken in Glasgow can and should be further consolidated in view of COP27 planned for Egypt next November. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dialogue and fraternity are two essential focal points in our efforts to overcome the crisis of the present moment. Yet despite numerous efforts aimed at constructive dialogue among nations, the, def the deafening noise of war and conflict is intensifying. The entire international community must address the urgent need to find solutions to endless conflicts that at times appear as true proxy wars. I think first of Syria, where the country's rebirth does not yet clearly appear on the horizon. Even today, the Syrian people mourn their dead and the loss of everything and continue to hope for a better future. Political and constitutional reforms are required for that country to be reborn, but the imposition of sanctions should not strike directly at everyday life in order to promote a glimmer of hope to the general populace increasingly caught in the grip of poverty. Nor can we overlook the conflict in Yemen, a human tragedy that has gone on for years, silently. Far from the spotlight of the media and with a certain indifference on the part of the international community, even as it continues to claim numerous civil victims, particularly men and ch women and children. In the past year, no steps forward have been made in the peace process between Israel and Palestine. I would truly like to see these two peoples rebuild mutual trust and resume, res and resume speaking directly to each other in order to reach the point where they can live in two states, side by side, in peace and security, without hatred and resentment, but the healing born of mutual forgiveness. Other sources of concern are the constitutional tension are the institutional tensions in Libya, the episodes of violence by inter of international terrorism in the Sahel region. And the internal conflicts in Sudan, South Sudan and Ethiopia where there is no where there is need to find once again the path of reconciliation and peace through a forthright encounter that places the needs of the people above all else. Profound situations of inequality and injustice, endemic corruption and various forms of poverty that offend the dignity of persons also continue to fuel social conflicts on the American continent, where growing polarization is not helping to resolve the real and pressing problems of its people, especially those who are most poor and vulnerable.
Reciprocal trust and readiness to engage in calm discussion should also inspire all parties at stake so that acceptable and lasting solutions can be found in Ukraine and in the Southern Caucasus, and the outbreaking of new crises can be avoided in the Balkans, primarily in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Dialogue and fraternity are all the more urgently needed for dealing wisely and effectively with the crisis which for almost a year now has affected Myanmar. Its streets, once places of encounter, are now the scene of fighting that does not even spare houses of prayer. Naturally, these conflicts are exacerbated by the abundance of weapons at hand and the unscrupulousness of those who make every effort to supply them. At times, we deceive ourselves into thinking that these weapons serve to dissuade potential aggressors. History, and sadly, even daily news reports make it clear that this is not the case. Those who possess weapons will eventually use them, since as St. Paul VI observed, a person cannot love with offensive weapons in his hands. Furthermore, when we yield to the logic of arms and distance ourselves from the practice of dialogue, we forget to our detriment that even before causing victims and ruination, weapons can create nightmares. Today, these concerns have become even more real. If we consider the availability and employment of autonomous weapon systems, that can have terrible and unforeseen consequences and should be subject to the responsibility of the international community. Among the weapons humanity has produced, nuclear arms are of particular concern. At the end of December last, the 10th review conference of the parties to the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, which was to meet in New York in these days, was once again postponed due to the pandemic. A world free of nuclear arms is possible and necessary. I therefore express my hope that the international community will view that conference as an opportunity to take a significant step in that direction. The Holy See continues steadfastly to maintain that in the 21st century, nuclear arms are an inadequate and inappropriate means of responding to security threats and that possession of them is immoral. Their production diverts resources from integral human development and their employment not only has catastrophic humanitarian and environmental consequences, but also threatens the very existence of humanity. The Holy See likewise considers it important that the resumption of negotiations in Vienna on the nuclear accord with Iran, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, achieve positive results in order to guarantee a more secure and fraternal world. Dear Ambassadors, in my message for the World Day of Peace celebrated on January 1st last, I sought to highlight several factors that I consider essential for promoting a culture of dialogue and fraternity. Education holds a special place since it trains the younger generation, the future and hope of the world. Education is, in fact, the primary vehicle of integral human development, for it makes individuals free and responsible. The educational the process is slow and laborious and can lead at times to discouragement, but we can never abandon it. It is an outstanding expression of dialogue, for no true education can lack a dialogical structure. Education likewise gives rise to culture and builds bridges of encounter between peoples. The Holy See wishes wish to, exp to stress the importance of education also by its partition in Expo 2021 in Dubai, 
with a pavilion inspired by the theme of the Expo, Connecting Minds, Creating the Future. The Catholic Church has always recognized and valued the role of education in the spiritual, moral, and social growth of the young. It pains me then to acknowledge that in different educational sitting settings, parishes and schools, the abuse of minors has occurred, resulting in serious psychological and spiritual consequences for those who experienced them. These are crimes, and they call for a firm resolve to investigate them fully, examining each case to ascertain responsibility, to ensure justice to the victims, and to prevent similar atrocities from taking place in the future. Despite the gravity of such acts, no society can ever abdicate its responsibility for education. Yet, regrettably, state budgets often allocate few resources for education, which tends to be viewed as an expense instead of the best possible investment for the future. The pandemic prevented many young people from attending school to the detriment of their personal and social development. Modern technology enabled many young people to take refuge in virtual realities that create strong psychological and emotional links that isolate them from others and the world around them, radically modifying social relationships. In making this point, I in no way intend to deny the usefulness of technology and its products, which make it possible for us to connect with one another easily and quickly. But I do appeal urgently that we be watchful, lest these instruments substitute for true human relationships at the international, familial, social, and international levels. If we learn to isolate ourselves at an early age, it will later prove more difficult to build bridges of fraternity and peace. In a world where there is just me, it is difficult to make room for us. The second thing that I would like to mention briefly is labor, an indispensable factor in building and keeping peace. Labor is an expression of ourselves and our gifts, but also of our commitment, self-investment, and cooperation with others, since we always work with or for someone else. Seen in this clearly social perspective, the workplace enables us to learn to make our contribution towards a more humanable and beautiful world. We have seen that the pandemic has sorely tested the global economy with serious repercussions Concussions on those families and workers who experienced situations of psychological distress even before the onset of the economical troubles. This has further highlighted persistent inequalities in various social and economic sectors. Here we can include access to clean water, food, education, and medical care. The number of people falling under the category of extreme poverty has shown a marked increase. In addition, the health crisis forced many workers to change professions, and in some cases forced them to enter the underground economy, causing them to lose the social protections provided for in many countries. In this context, we see even more clearly the importance of labor, since economic de development cannot exist without it, nor can it be thought that modern technology can replace the surplus value of human labor. Human labor provides an opportunity for the discovery of our personal dignity for encounter with others and for human growth. It is a privileged means whereby each person participates actively in the human good and offers a concrete contribution to peace. Here, too, greater cooperation is needed among all actors on the local, national, regional, and global levels, especially in the short term, given the challenges posed by the desired ecological conversion. The coming years will be a 
time of opportunity for developing a new, new services and enterprises increasing access to dignified work and devising new means of ensuring respect for human rights and adequate levels of remuneration and social prote protection. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the Prophet Jeremiah tells us that God has plans for our welfare and not for evil to give us a future and a hope. We should be unafraid then to make room for peace in our lives by cultivating dialogue and fraternity among one another. The gift of peace is contagious. It radiates from the hearts of those who long for it and aspire to share it and spreads throughout the whole world. To each of you, your families, and the peoples you represent, I renew my blessing and offer my heartfelt good wishes for a year of serenity and peace. Thank you. Our Holy Father, on the conclusion of his address, this annual moment in which the diplomatic corps, ambassadors representing their countries to the Holy See, get together and express their wishes for a new year. As of last year, the Holy See had diplomatic relations with 183 states. In addition, it also has relations with the European Union, the Sovereign Military Order of Malta, and Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, after the Holy Father exits at the end of this audience, the heads of mission and charge d'affaires are asked to leave first. And they will go to the Sistine Chapel, where a photo will be taken with, along with the Secretary of State. So these diplomats will now go to the Sistine Chapel, where a photo will be taken. The Holy See began to accredit ambassadors to the Holy See in the 15th century. And little by little, the habit of various countries to have diplomatic missions in or to the Holy See increasingly became more and more common, extending even into the 20th century, where many more countries, especially after World War I, began to send delegations to the Holy See. This now brings to an end this live broadcast of the meeting of our Holy Father with the diplomatic representatives of various countries to the Holy See. We invite you to visit the Vatican News web portal, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube accounts where you will find coverage of today's meeting as well as other Vatican and world news. On behalf of Vatican Media, I'd like to thank all of the technicians who've made this broadcast possible, especially our in-studio technical coordinators, and to all of you for joining us. Laudetur Jesus Christus. Praised be Jesus Christ.